record it today. Yes, I will make the um, backup recording. And dear friends and colleagues, we start now. And I would like to welcome you from very cold and snowy Berlin to today's collaborative event of the Research Center on Anti-Gypsism at the Department of History at Heidelberg University and the Holocaust Studies Program at Western Galilee College. And thank you, uh, Carola, for the very nice collaboration. <laughs> Our event entitled The Genocide of European Roma, Witnesses, Survivors and Partisans is being held in the context of International Holocaust Memorial Day on January 27 this year. As you see, it is dedicated to the commemoration of the Nazi genocide of European Roma. And also this August, we will remember the 80th anniversary of one, on the, of, one of the most deadly peaks of the genocide. On August 2 and 3, 1944, the last prisoners of the so-called gypsy camp, still alive in the Auschwitz-Birkenau concentration camp, were murdered. Only very few of them, including several children, survived the so-called liquidation in Nazi vocabulary. For a long time, as you all know, this genocide was denied, not recognized, and therefore there are still many blind spots until today. One of the persecuted from then was 18-year-old Otto Rosenberg, born in East Prussia, who was stigmatized as a gypsy from an early age. In the summer of 1936, in the run-up to the Olympic Games, in Germany, he was deported with his family to the Berlin Marzahn forced labor and collection camp at the age of nine. From then on, he not only had to live in inhumane conditions and was no longer allowed to attend a regular school, he and his family were also racially and biologically registered by the SS. At the age of 13, Otto Rosenberg was forced to work in an armaments factory in Berlin. A few days before his 15th birthday, he and his family were deported to Auschwitz, where most of them were murdered. Just yesterday, the German press announced that the Catholic Church in Germany is to have its role in the persecution and murder of Sinti and Roma during the Nazi era comprehensively investigated in conjunction with the Central Council of Sinti and Roma. This was a long time coming. For the last surviving witnesses and survivors, children and young people at the time, it is now one of the last opportunities to bear personal witness to the crimes and the murder of their relatives. Otto Rosenberg already passed away in 2001. It is all the more pleasant that we have three speakers with us today who will present little research aspects of this history. Unfortunately, our colleague, Dr. Boas Cohen, head of Holocaust Studies program at Western Galilee, cannot be with us today as he is serving as a reservist in the army. But um, some hours earlier, he sent a video message uh, this afternoon that I would like to share with you now. Let me see. I can't hear. Maybe everyone hears. So can you hear? No, I can't. No, there's no. no, so no. Oh, sorry. You have to share with share with. Okay, with good that you say this. Um, mm -hmm. because it said it's shared already. I will try it again. 
but you have to put with audio. Yes, uh, but I shared it. Ah, I, oh, wow, how can I share my audio? Let me see. Just one second. I parallel, I uh, just one second. I have it here on my smartphone too. Es gibt drei kleine Punkte, da steht Computerton wählen. Wenn man das anklickt, kommt auch der Ton bei der PowerPoint, äh, bei der Zoom-Übertragung. Okay, mehr. Und dann unter mehr und wo? Äh, Computerton teilen. Nur so kann man Bewegtbild mit Ton hören. Okay, now I think I got it and I, we will try again and please tell me if it's not working. Hello everybody. As you can see, I'm okay. still in Germany and unfortunately today I cannot attend this uh, event. I want to thank you, thank first of all, thank Verena and uh, our colleagues from Heidelberg for organizing this uh, important uh, seminar. Uh, I'm th I thank you all the people who are coming. It seems that it's not easy to uh, for me to bring together army life and the uh, academic life. So uh, it is thanks to Verena that we have this uh, wonderful uh, seminar. And uh, I want to thank everyone who pitched in and to thank the speakers. And hopefully next time I'll be able to be a part of it all. Goodbye, everyone. And uh, keep doing the good work. Okay, now you heard him. Okay, before we start now, I would like to ask you to write your questions uh, during the lectures in the chat. Our moderator, Professor Tanya Penta, will take care of them. And now it is my pleasure to introduce to you Tan Tanya Penta, who is a professor of Eastern European history at Heidelberg University in Germany. She is director of, res of the Research Center on Anti-Gypsism in German, the Forschungsstelle Antiziganismus at Heidelberg University and speaker of the German Research, Fo research Foundation funded research training group with the title Ambivalent Enmity Dynamics of Antagonism in Europe, Asia, and the Middle East. Her main areas of research include the history of Russia and Ukraine in the 20th century, the comparison of dictatorships, the persecution of Nazi crimes in the Soviet Union, and the compensation for victims of Nazi crimes. And now, please, Professor Penta, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, um, uh, Verena, and um... Thank you also uh, for organizing this um, great collaboration, uh, Verena and Carola. So it's a, a, a pleasure to be here with you tonight. And um, we have three fascinating topics to, to discuss, two contributions. Um, we will hear them and start with uh, Dr. Carola Fins. I would like to int introduce her first. She is a historian and since 2020, head of the project Encyclopedia of the Nazi Genocide of the Sinti and Roma in Europe, funded by uh, the Federal Foreign Office of Germany, of Germany. And we are very happy in Heidelberg to have her at our research center of anti-gypsyism. Prior to that, she was uh, from 2003 to 2020, a deputy, deputy director of the City of Cologne's Documentation Center on National Socialism. And the persecution of Sinti and Roma under National Socialism is one of her long-standing research focuses. It's, it's her life topic, um, let's say that, and she has published very important publications on this, um, on this topic. She curated also a digital edition, Voices of the Victims in Rom Archive, the digital archive of arts and cultures of Roma and Sinti. And she is a member of the German delegation of the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance from 2019 to 2021. She was part of the Independent Commission of Anti-Gypsyism 
set up by the German government, which also did very important um, uh, also political work um, for for the for the German context uh, to to make this um, to to get more attention to, uh, for this important topic. So, Carola, we look forward to your presentation. You you are still muted. Now, the computer is running a little bit slow. Sorry for that. Don't know why. But I started sharing my screen. And um, I also would like to thank for your kind introduction and to say warm well, welcome to all participants. And I hope, oh, it's so slow today. Sorry. No. Uh, do, you can hear me, but my is my my screen frozen? Ah, no. Can you see my screen ah, now? We can see it. Now we can see it. Oh, yes. Wonderful. Okay. Well, it takes unfortunately some time, but we have to have patience today. Patience today. So it was Verena's idea to hold this event, uh, and I'm happy that we managed <laughs> to do it. And so here we are. I hope once it's started, it's uh, going well. Yes. So, um, well, even if we can no longer speak of a forget forgotten genocide today, knowledge of the history of this national socialist crime is still not widespread and continues to play a subordinate role in university teaching and school lessons. One problem is certainly that reliable knowledge is not available so easily. The encyclopedia that I will be presenting today aims to counteract this. In my lecture, I will not only talk about the genocide, which meant persecution and death for hundreds of thousands of Sinti and Roma. Furthermore, I will like to talk about the ideas behind the encyclopedia, which will be hopefully important for future research for recognition of the genocide and the culture of remembrance. In a way, the Encyclopedia of the Holocaust, published in Hebrew in, in English and in English in 1990 and in German in 1993, is a model for our encyclopedia. Our project is based, as already said, at Heidelberg University and funded by the German Federal Foreign Office. To ensure the scholarly quality of the encyclopedia, we have an academic council made up of eight internationally recognized experts on National Socialism, the Holocaust, and the Second World War, and among them is Tanya Pente, and I'm very grateful for that. In addition to myself, there are two research assistants and two student assistants. I think two of them are at least here, Diana and Martin, hello to you all. That's a small number of people for such a big task, of course, but currently more than 80 researchers from 25 countries are working together with us on the encyclopedia. This is a collaborative work, of course, and while working on it, an international network is just being created, which we urgently need to make progress, but both quantitatively and qualitatively in terms of research. The encyclopedia will contain more than 1,000 lemmas, e.g. encyclopedic entries, entries or texts. The first result, approximately 300 of them, will be available online from 6th of March this year in German and English. The whole content will hopefully be ready by the end of 2025. A print version in German will be produced afterwards. 
Against the background of the specific problems in our field of research, the Encyclopedia of the Nazi Genocide of Sinti and Roma has several aims. First, to collect the existing knowledge. Second, to process this knowledge in a critical and research ethical reflection on scientific practice. Third, to make this knowledge available to an international public. Fourth, to promote exchange within the scientific communities. Fifth, to stimulate further research and to be a dignified symbol for the acknowledgement of the genocide, as well as a gesture of recognition for the victims and their descendants. Before I go into further details, I would like to take a brief look at the photograph we have chosen to announce this lecture. It shows the deportation of German Sinti and Roma in May 1940. Photographs are not at the forefront of the encyclopedia, but they will play a role as important sources to illustrate the persecution events. And we are currently planning to publish 300 of them. Particular importance is attached to the careful selection of photographs. Photographs, especially from the nationalist, nationalist uh, mystic apparatus and from the perspective of the majority society are problematic sources because they often degrade the victims and give a false impression of the reality of life. Moreover, they conceal the actual relations of power. And in addition, the impact of photographs must be considered, which far exceeds the written word. Therefore, there is also a curatorial concept for the image sources we show in the encyclopedia. I think that dealing with this particular photograph can illustrate very well how the online encyclopedia creates a network of knowledge that provides the context necessary to understand this photograph. Each photo is accompanied by a detailed caption. It describes what we can see in the photo, when it was taken and by whom, to what historical moment it relates to. The event shown here is categorized as the first family deportation of Sinti and Roma. The cause of the deportation in May 1940 is briefly explained. Those responsible are named and reference is made to what happened to the victims of the deportation. The caption shows the links that refer to lemmas in the encyclopedia in our example here. This allows you to quickly find out what the May deportation was, what role Weisführer SS Heinrich Himmler played in the persecution, how he used the term Roma, what the situation was like in the general government, and much more. Now let us take a brief look at research. In 1972, the destiny of Europe's gypsies appeared. This was the first attempt to an overall account of the persecution and murder of the European Sinti and Roma, 27 years after the end of the war. Not only this is remarkable, but also the context in which it was written. Both authors, Donald Kenwick and Gretchen Paxson, were active in the then emerging international Roma civil rights movement. The activists had recognized that the lack of recognition of the genocide was one of the reasons why racism against Sinti and Roma continued after 1945. The demand for recognition of the genocide was therefore one of the movement's central political goals. The destiny of Europe gypsies was a milestone in raising awareness of the genocide, but unfortunately, the book was not echoed in academia. In the 1970s and the 1980s, however, some remarkable studies were published on various countries, such as the Netherlands, Czechoslovakia, and Austria. In the last 20 years, a hardly manageable wealth of studies has appeared in individual countries, which are becoming more and more differentiated. In addition to overall presentations, there are source documentations and important initiatives from the communities to create survivors' testimonies for research and to open up new sources and approaches. Michael Zimmermann's postdoctoral thesis, published in 1996, paved the way for the subject of research to enter the universities like no other, at least in German-speaking countries. 
It was the first attempt to present the genocide committed against Sinti and Roma in its European, European dimension on a broad source basis. Unfortunately, this book was never translated into English. Thanks to the initiative of the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance and the work of Anna Avakunova and Ilse Nabu, we have a bibliography on the research field that reflects the status up to 2015 and which is, by the way, available online. Well, to sum it up, research has increased significantly in scope and quality over the last 20 years. But there's far too little exchange, and it is sometimes incredible, diffic incredibly difficult to find access to the research. Important publications are often not translated into English and sometimes not even to be found in libraries. Although we have quite a lot of knowledge, this knowledge is highly fragmented. Also, the quality and depth of the state of research are extremely heterogeneous for the European countries. That's why a format like the encyclopedia is very helpful for this subject area. Like a puzzle, it can be put together piece by piece until, until an overall picture emerges. Another question I asked myself when designing the online encyclopedia was, aren't there already offerings in the internet that depict the European dimension of the genocide? Let's take a look at the websites that make this claim. The first, top left, is an offer aimed primarily at teaching in schools. It was quite created on the Austrian initiative and with the support again of the IRA and has been online since 2012. The portal, which is now available in 12 languages, aims to provide educational material on the genocide. The content is conveyed via so-called worksheets in PDF format, each dominated by a photograph. Since these are mostly taken from the perspective of the majority society, anti-Gypsy perspectives prevail if you come to the contents. The effect of which it is to be feared can hardly be counteracted by even the best teaching. The website is currently based, being revised in terms of content and technology. The second, top right, in 2012, and again with the support of the IRA, a website was created by the Netherlands National Committee 4th and 5th May. It focuses on the biographies of children and young people in Europe. The biographies are provided with contextual information on the individual countries. Due to the biographical approach and the, of course, manageable number of examples, the limitation in terms of content and geography is obvious. We also have an online exhibition of the Documentation and Cultural Center of German Sinti and Roma, which has been available in German and English since 2018. This is the documentation of a traveling exhibition, which, although it also depicts the European dimension, can only be exemplary due to the limitations of the presentation possibilities within the framework of this exhibition. And now the fourth example. In connection with ROM archive, it has been already mentioned, the di digital archive of the Sinti and Roma, I created the presentation Voices of the Victims, which went online in 2019. Voices of the Victims is a digital edition of sources created exclusively from the perspective of those affected by persecution. Voices of the Victims includes exemplary sources from 20 countries and was developed with an international team of researchers. A short result of this overview there's no website where I can reliably find information on all European countries and on all aspects of persecution. Let's now take a look at Europe during the Second World War. A total of 33 countries are currently being covered for the encyclopedia. From A for Austria to U for United Kingdom, you can see the names of the countries at the top right of the map. We know little or nothing about the situation of Roma during the Second World War in 13 countries, which is why they have been put aside for the time being. 
As already mentioned, more than 80 authors are currently wor working on the encyclopedia. Most of them are organized in one of the 18 working groups that we have set up for various countries since 2020. Sometimes the working groups consist of one author and the research staff of the encyclopedia project, sometimes of several authors and the project team. For example, we have a working group for post, all post-Yugoslavian countries, uh, so Croatia, Serbia, Northern Macedonia, Bosnia-Herzegovina, Kosovo, Slovenia, and Montenegro, in which five researchers work together with us, with the project team. So, you can see the starting page of the encyclopedia, so you get a very exclusive insight, which will be available to you from March, from the 6th of March on. The content can be accessed in various ways. All lemmas are sorted from A to Z. You can access specific topics via rubrics. An index helps you to find places, people, keywords, and the authors involved. A chronolo chronology contains all important dates. And we also present, as mentioned, photographs. There will be an interactive map containing all the crime scenes and in addition, historical overview maps and specific maps we will produce, especially for the encyclopedia, showing, for example, all the detention camps in France or all the massacre sites in occupied Poland. In the following, I would like to take a closer look at the rubrics. The thousand lemmas can be sorted according to the following overarching areas. It's spaces, countries, regions, and places. So you click there and you find, for example, Estonia or Latvia or France. You see regions like, like East Prussia, Transnistria, or Alsace and Moselle. And you find, of course, a lot of places. Then we have the crime scenes where you can find the internments, the camps, ghettos, and murder sites. The persecution system is structured like institutions, persons, concepts, and laws. We have the life paths of Sinti and Roma. We dedicate, of course, several topics to the aftermath, justice, compensation, and commemoration. And there is this kind of glossary from anti-Gypsyism to Cyclone B to give background information. In keeping with the occasion of the event, I would now like to give a few examples from the crime scenes rubric. Hereby, I will present three ma major complexes of crimes that are essential to the genocide of Sinti and Roma and can be found in different dimensions everywhere in Europe. Just detention camps exclusively for Sinti and Roma, deportations and concentration and extermination camps, and murder sites where the so-called Holocaust by ballots took place. For this lecture, I illustrate the examples with photographs. Yes, it's always easy to take some photographs <laughs> and it's easy to follow, of course. But however, I would like to remind you of the approach described at the beginning and emphasize once again that the text in the encyclopedia, the written word, will clearly take center stage. Now, first of all, one important step within the persecution is the spatial segregation from the rest of the population. In Germany, from 1935 until the beginning of the war, about half of the Sinti and Roma were locked up in detention camps, the so-called Zigeunerlager. Here we see the camp in Cologne, where at times several hundred people had to live. There was also a network of detention camps in German-occupied France, whereby the incarceration of Roma, Sinti, Manouche had already been ordered before the German invasion. In the protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia, there were, there were two large detention camps that had the character of concentration camps, Leti in Bohemia and, Morav and Rodonin in Moravia. In Austria, too, Roma and Sinti were forcibly sent to camps that have been exclusively erected for the minority. Lakenbach was the largest and also the cruelest of them. Separate camps for Sinti and Roma existed at different times almost everywhere in the German sphere of power. 
However, other forms of restriction of freedom of movement and imprisonment, imprisonments are also known. For example, immobilization, the so-called festsetzung, house arrest, especially in France, and banishment, which was practiced in Italy. Segregation was often followed by deportation to concentration camps, ghettos, or extermination camps. The deportation of individual members of the communities to concentration camps began immediately after the Nazis seized power and continued to grow in extent until the end of the war. In 1938 and 1939, already several hundred Sinti and Roma from Germany and Austria were deported to Dachau, Buchenwald, and Sachsenhausen. We see here on one photo Austrian Roma who were deported to Buchenwald via Lakenbach and the Dachau concentration camp. Systematic deportations of entire families began from the Reich in May 1940. In autumn 1941, 5,000 Austrian Roma from Burgenland were deported to the Litzmannstadt ghetto, more than half of them children. None of them survived. Those who had not already died in the ghetto were murdered in gas vans in the Kulmhof extermination camp at the end of 1941 to the beginning of 1942. In the fascist independent state of Croatia, Roma were systematically deported to the Yasinovac camp and murdered there. Around 16,000 names of those murdered have since been identified. Romania, Romania drove about 25,000 Roma, 25, Roma across the Bug River to Transnistria in 1942. More than half of them did not survive. In February 1943, the deportations of the Sinti and Roma to the concentration and extermination camp Auschwitz-Birkenau began. More than 22,000 people were deported from the Reich, Austria, the Protectorate, from occupied Poland, and then in 1944 from the occupied countries of Belgium and Northern France, as well as the Netherlands. Around 90% of the deportees did not survive. This very short overview only includes some of the large systematic deportations. In addition, there were repeated deportations of individuals or smaller groups to concentration and extermination camps. It should also be remembered that cruel medical crimes were committed against Sinti and Roma in the concentration camps, that Sinti and Roma were also victims of forced sterilization and so-called euthanasia. The genocide of the Sinti and Roma was predominantly carried out outside camps. There were hundreds of sites where Roma were killed on the spot. Many of these crimes, which were committed mainly in Central, Eastern and Southeastern Europe, have not yet been clarified. In addition, little attention has been paid so far to the crimes committed in the last months of the war against smaller groups or individuals in all war zones, also in Western Europe. In German-occupied Serbia, Roma were victims of the infamous hostage killings by the thousands. For every German soldier injured or killed in the war, the military commander had 50 or 100 prisoners designated as hostages shot. These were mostly Jews, but also Roma. For German-occupied Poland alone, 180 killing sites are known where smaller or larger groups of Roma were shot. The crime scenes in the German-occupied Soviet Union are far from being fully recorded. Around 140 killing sites of Roma in German-occupied Ukraine alone are identified so far. This was only a very small excerpt from the diverse content that will be found in the encyclopedia, and it would not be the time to go into more detail. Nevertheless, I would like to point out one aspect because it is important to me. In the encyclopedia, there will be approximately 150 biographies of people who were affected by persecution. This is important in order to break through the perpetrator narrative, to present people in their social context before persecution, to highlight their individuality and agency. 
These biographies also allow for a narrative of the diverse persecution measures that lasted for many years and transcended the borders of countries and occupation regimes. For example, on the left, we see the Bamberger family from Germany in the 1930s. Margarete Bamberger, front left, was later deported to Auschwitz. Max Bam Bamberger, far right, escaped deportation but fell victim to a massacre while fleeing in occupied Yugoslavia shortly before the end of the war. The biographies can also illustrate how extensively families were affected by persecution. Many families were completely wiped out of others, as in the case of the Czech Kia family, only few survived. Of the once 10 member family, only three survived Auschwitz Birkenau. Of course, there will also be biographies of survivors whose perspectives on what they experienced and also on their work after 1945 should gain more visibility. For example, Chaya Stoika, who made a significant contribution to raising awareness to the genocide of Sinti and Roma through her publications and also artistic activities. This is where I happen to be at the end of my presentation. I have not been able to touch on many aspects, but I hope uh, on many aspects as much as I wouldn't want it to, but I hope that you have gained a first impression, not only of the encyclopedia, but also of the topic it deals with. We are currently concentrating on compiling the texts on the individual countries and the crime scenes, but there will also be overarching topics that will be covered, such as the special situation of children and young people, Verena and I already talked about that. Uh, Nazi trials will be a topic, compensation, the culture of remembrance and so on. There will also be uh, overviews of important sources and here above all, of these institutions that have compiled large collections of interviews with survivors in order to make them more, uh, more known. Well, I'm now looking forward to the contributions by Wola Bartas and Michal Hoyak, who are both authors of the encyclopedia. <laughs> Thank you all for your attention. Yeah. Thank you very much, um, Carola, for your, this great overview and also for sharing this impressive uh, visual materials with us. Um, we will have time for um, discussion at the end, but now we come to our second uh, presenter, Dr. Volha Bartas. I would like to shortly introduce her. Volha Bartas is an ethnologist and historian of Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union at Regensburg University. She has published on the history of, and culture of Roma communities and their memory of the Nazi genocide in World War II. Her current research interests include the relationship of his, history and memory, memory and borders, grassroots activism, and the state. Methodologically, uh, her research seeks to integrate archival history, oral history, and ethnography. She is committed to the practice of writing history from below and reconstructing the experiences of vulnerable and marginalized populations. So, Bola, the floor is yours, and we look forward to your presentation. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for this uh, nice introduction, Professor Panta, and uh, uh, thank you, Verena, for and Carola for organizing this wonderful event. It's a great pleasure for me uh, to present my research in this event today, and I'd like to focus on uh, um, somewhat less known topic, which is uh, the resistance uh, of uh, Roma to the Nazi violence and uh, persecution. And uh, the Soviet ground offers endless possibilities for the conceptual explorations of Romani resistance and uh, resistance more generally. Uh, when I sent uh, the title of uh, my talk to Verena, she asked her a very reasonable question. 
uh, why uh, wouldn't I change uh, my title for survival and resistance in instead of uh, survival or resistance? And um, well, I've decided to stick to my initial title because I uh, like alternative questions, but uh, I think that uh, Verena's suggestion actually makes a lot of uh, sense because how do we tell survival from resistance and uh, is survival in extreme conditions a form of resistance or practicing a Romani cultural tradition during, during the war or going in hiding? And in my work, uh, I'm very much preoccupied with uh, the concepts of survival agency and victimhood. And I asked, asked not only how did people die, but uh, how did people survive? How did they survive in the wilderness or when it comes to the former <clears throat> Soviet Union in the middle of uh, ice of, or and snow? And where did they take strands to go on? And in the former Soviet Union, many uh, Roma survived because they joined uh, the resistance movement. This happened often after they uh, lost their families and experienced uh, Nazi violence themselves. So they were victims and fighters at the same time. And um, Resistance doesn't necessarily stay in opposition to victimhood, and victimhood doesn't necessarily mean passivity and choiceness. Victims act, reflect about their plight, and make important decisions. Actually, many Jewish studies scholars wrote about uh, resistance. For example, Nikam Matek articulated that the very idea of resistance is very complex as is uh, the idea of Jewish resistance. According to Tech, resistance may be individual or take collective organized forms that are further differentiated in terms of passive, active, armed, unarmed, spiritual, non-spiritual. Tech asks whether individual participation of Jews in national undergrounds could be seen as Jewish resistance. And we could actually ask a similar question about uh, Romani resistance. In the German occupied Soviet Union, there were no Romani partisan units. And even self-defense groups of civilians included people from different ethnic backgrounds. And Romani families often cooperated with the Jews who fled from ghettos and with the Red Army soldiers who found themselves in a roundup. So in this talk, I would like to zoom in on the roles that Roma played in the Soviet partisan movement. And I'll also try to a bit problematize the topic a bit in the light of available sources. And um, uh, so what are the sources? These are mostly personal files from partisan archives, memoirs of partisans and oral histories with Roma families. I will also share some uh, slides with um, archival documents and photographs, although I don't have uh, many today. Okay, I'm sharing my screen now. Right. So <clears throat> the Soviet partisan movement was uh, uh, most numerous and influential in most parts of the German occupied Soviet Union. And uh, first uh, partisan units were formed as early as summer 1941. And they were um, organized by the Red Army militaries who found themselves in an encirclement. The tactics included sabotage activities, political propaganda among the local population and uh, armed fight against Nazi police and Einsatzgruppen. 
uh, the um, archival database that um, I use a lot in my research. Um, it's called Partisans of Belarus, and uh, it is uh, available at the website of the National Archives of Belarus. And it provides information for more uh, than uh, 200,000 partisans that were decorated after World War II. Uh, 56 uh, Belarusian partisans of Roma origins are among them. So these are only those who received decorations for their military performance. This is quite a lot for such a small minority. But of course, this is not all because um, many female and child partisans went undocumented as I will later um, demonstrate in some of my slides. But let's take a look at the chronology of the movement and the time when most Roma joined partisan units because this also tells us a lot about their motivation. So um, there were very few Roma partisans who joined the movement from its very beginning already in summer, autumn 1941, but Ivan Zykov was uh, among them. And uh, his uh, personal file at the National Archives allows at least for a partial reconstruction of his biography. So what we learn from this um, file is that Ivan Zykov was born in 1915 and he received the order of the Red Banner, which was one of the highest military decorations in the Soviet Union. And the information on his award sheet allows for um, uh, some um, insight in uh, uh, his biography. So he was a native of uh, the Perm region of Russia and served in the border troops of the Red Army since 1935. And he was uh, actually one of those Soviet soldiers who found themselves rounded up in the beginning of the Nazi occupation. Zykov was able to organize one of first partisan groups in the Pinsk region already in August, 1941. So he was basically one of the initiators of the resistance movement in his region. And his group consisted primarily of the uh, former Soviet uh, prisoners of war. And um, since 1942, he planned and led a number of actions against Nazi puni punitive forces. It is very interesting that the documents from his file gradually downplay his ethnicity, while um, some of them mention that Ivan was uh, um, gypsy, it's a gun, then uh, his decoration sheet uh, states that he was a Russian. We can uh, only guess why this happened. Um, but other partisans from his unit clearly identified him as a Rome who was very proud of his ethnicity in their memoirs. Yet these memoirs also demonstrate how cultural stereotypes shaped the perceptions of Romani partisans by others, and sometimes prevented the others from seeing the true roles that trauma played in the resistance movement. Carola already mentioned that. And in my research, I also try to um, start from community-based sources, not, um, not from the sources produced by outsiders, but unfortunately it's not always possible. So let me give you just one example. In his memoir, Alexey Klyshov, another partisan leader from Pinsk region, recalled Ivan Zaikov as a clever and experienced commander, also known for his exotic outfits and passion for horses. Having been a Tsigan, he says, a gypsy by nationality, he kept to his passion for everything bright and eye-catching, even in the conditions of partisan life. It was a brave, smart, and uh, a smart uh, and uh, inventive commander 
in spite of all the exotics of his outfit. So, uh, unlike, um, let me re return to my initial question about the chronology. Unlike uh, Zaykov, most Roma came to the movement in 1942. And historians well know that this time coincided with the escalation of Nazi violence against Roma in most parts of the German-occupied Soviet Union. So if we looked through the personal files of uh, Romani partisans, we would notice that at the point when they enrolled in these units, many didn't have families. And um, just two examples, one um, um, of two female partisans, one is a um, um, decoration sheet of Stanislava Chubreva, the fighter of the Suvorov partisan unit. And uh, this um, file has a very brief biographical note that nevertheless gives her some hint about her fate. So Stanislava Chubreva was born in uh, the Smolensk Oblast in 19... 24. And her documents, her file mentions that uh, she joined the war of unit in November 1942, after her family had been murdered by the Germans. Stanislava participated in four open battles and five partisan operations that led to the destruction of five military vehicles. And on many occasions, she was said to um, obtain new weapons for her unit. And she was decorated with a medal to the partisan of the Patriotic War of the Second Decree. Then, Olga Ivanova, born in 1917, served as a scout and fighter in the Chapayev unit in Pinsk region since March 1942. And by the way, it was the unit uh, led by Ivan Zaykov. And I was wondering um, what uh, role his uh, ethnicity and belonging to the Roma community played uh, in uh, accepting um, Roma uh, female partisan and his unit. So Olga took part in five battles that led to the destruction of local German garrisons. And um, her award letter praised her as an excellent, praises her as an excellent scout, who was able to obtain valuable information on the intentions and actions of the enemy, delivering the data to the command of the unit in a timely fashion. Olga's biographical details say that she didn't have relatives and didn't remember the place of her birth. Well, um, the latter fact uh, only suggests uh, that uh, Olga and her family probably traveled before the war, but it's difficult to say what happened to her family before she uh, joined the partisans. It is very probable that the loss of her family and a threat to her own life made Olga seek refuge among the partisans. The bitterness of their losses and their desire for revenge was what made these people motivated and fearless fighters. And um, even though it was often this uh, threat of uh, genocidal violence that brought them in partisan units, in partisan units, they shared their experiences with many people from other ethnic backgrounds. And um, Soviet partisan units were international or let's better say inter-ethnic by nature. Even if most of their members were local, uh, this is just one of um, the examples that I'm dealing with. This is the 4th uh, Belarusian Partisan Brigade and uh, their personnel list. This brigade operated in the northwest of the country 
and it included many locals of uh, Jewish, Romani, and Tatar origins. This is not to mention uh, ethnic Belarusians. And there were at least uh, four Roma in this brigade. I mean, uh, Romani fighters, because um, there could have been also women, but we don't have any record for them. So, and uh, it's interesting that uh, one of uh, these Romani men from this brigade, uh, who was born 1911, so he was um, of a bit older age, and he served as a horseman of the unit. And uh, this is something that I noticed while going uh, through the personal files of uh, Romani partisans, that they often looked after horses for their units. This is along with their military duties. So the historical expertise in looking after horses was um, obviously in high demand. Now, um, to put these stories into critical perspective, uh, it may seem that um, it was very easy to enter a partisan unit uh, for a Romani person and that uh, a personal desire to fight was enough. But uh, the, re the reality was very different and uh, it took a lot of time to figure out the whereabouts of a um, partisan unit. Um, one had to rely on the local networks and all the newcomers were very well checked and their identity was verified. And uh, in case of any suspicions, a suspicion they could be rejected or even worse. And um, second, it was um, a military movement and uh, their main goal was not saving lives, but fighting the enemy. So, um, um, so, um, a lot depended on uh, the capacity of uh, each individual to fight. Commanders' personal attitudes came into play as well. And uh, um, some commanders, for example, were reluctant to accept the Jews because of their anti-Semitic attitudes. And uh, actually the same goes uh, uh, for the Roma. And uh, some uh, partisan memoirs clearly portray traveling Roma as useless people and a burden to the movement. And um, uh, actually our colleague uh, from uh, Ukraine, Mikhail Tsagli was uh, able uh, to find uh, several uh, memoirs uh, of um, Soviet partisan leaders who described how Romani women and children were chased away by uh, Soviet partisans because uh, they uh, didn't uh, see any um, use, um, potent uh, how they could uh, um, make uh, any use of them potentially. So um, gender and uh, family status was another issue. And uh, joining a partisan group was generally easier for men than for women especially older women, because they were not seen as capable of uh, fighting. And likewise, bigger families were not welcome and the tasks carried out by women were not always recognized. This is a uh, um, post-war photograph of Vera and Alexander Yanovich. And this married couple stayed uh, in a partisan group together with their five children from whom I actually learned their story and Alexander and their older sons fulfilled military tasks uh, while Vera was always busy in the partisan camp and she helped with running a partisan household cleaning cooking doing the laundry for partisans of the Zhukov Brigade. And she did so in addition to caring for her own children, three of whom were very young. 
And um, as I've learned from the memoirs of um, the partisans from this very same Zhukov Brigade, they had uh, a very elaborate household with farm animals and horses, and even their own bakery and the kitchen where women cooked. So in the brigade, different uh, craftspeople were employed as well, who um, were often Jewish, shoemakers, seamstresses, and uh, um, horsemen. So, um, but these people were not uh, equally appreciated as uh, active fighters. For example, Viera was never officially recognized as a partisan, although she was uh, in the movement together with her husband. Uh, while her husband uh, um, was uh, decorated after the war and he received uh, a partisan certificate and uh, his portrait was included in the local memorial book. So there was some recognition for him, but no recognition for her. And uh, this was a kind of important in the post-war Soviet Union where veterans were entitled for certain social benefits. So, um, as Verena is writing me that you have another three minutes. Okay, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm about to summarize. So, um, Alexander received um, a partisan certificate like this. This uh, actually belonged to one of his relatives, not to him. Okay. So, um, yeah, I have more examples to give you, but I have to wrap up. So, um, okay. Then, um, to summarize, uh, despite um, all the criticism that I've uh, just mentioned, uh, Soviet partisans were probably the only resistance movement in the German-occupied Soviet Union that agreed to extend uh, different levels of uh, protection to Roma. So uh, um, thank you very much for your attention. And uh, if you would like to um, learn uh, about my research uh, on this topic and uh, read uh, more biographies of Roma partisans, then I'm happy to share the title of uh, this publication. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. And we will have hopefully some time also to um, ask you more questions at the end. This is really a fascinating topic. Um, and now we come to our last speaker. We will talk about the witnesses and survivors who speak the investigation of Yad in Unum about the Roma genocide. Um, I would like to introduce him shortly. Michael Boyak has uh, worked with Yad in Unum since 2010, when the organization began its research in Poland. And in the last 13 years, uh, Michael has participated in 50 research missions in Central and Eastern Europe and interviewed hundreds of eyewitnesses of the Holocaust and of the genocide of Roma. As director of Yahad in Unum Research Center since 2020, he has specialized in the research of the Holocaust in Poland, Ukraine, and in, in the Baltic states. And he's also involved in Yahad in Unum's research project in Guatemala and Iraq. Himself, he is currently conducting research on the mass killings of Jews and Roma perpetrated by Nazi units on the territories of the general government, general Gouvernement, between 1939 and 1945. Yeah, so um, Michael, we look forward to your final presentation. Thank you very much for the introduction. We'll just share my screen. 
Can you see it? So uh, thank you, uh, Tanya, for the introduction. And uh, I wanted also to thank uh, Verena and Carola uh, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be a part of this uh, discussion. Um, and uh, uh, welcome to everyone. So at first, I will briefly uh, explain uh, and introduce the, the mission of our organization to make you uh, understand the reason of my presence here. And then I will uh, talk uh, more about uh, our activities uh, regarding the uh, genocide of uh, Roma. So as uh, Tanya mentioned, uh, I work for Yahadinunum, uh, which is a French-based uh, organization founded by uh, the Catholic priest Father uh, Patrick uh, Dubois, and the organization is dedicated to the study of genocide and, and mass violence. We are mostly known for our work about uh, the Holocaust by bullets, uh, the mass uh, killings of, 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 of Jews, um, uh, in Eastern occupied uh, territory, mainly occupied Soviet uh, republics, but uh, not only. Uh, the estimation are uh, nowadays that more than uh, two millions of Jews were, were killed on these territories, mostly during mass killings. And our work is being done uh, on the premise that the systematic killings uh, of uh, Jews, but also of uh, other groups targeted by Nazis uh, on these territories uh, were not done uh, in secret. And uh, these crimes were very often carried out um, uh, in public, in broad daylight, in front of uh, the neighbors, the bystanders, the, the witnesses, uh, depending how we call them. And some of them are still alive until uh, today and uh, they are willing to be uh, filmed and share uh, their um, testimony. So for almost two decades uh, after an in-depth study uh, within archives, our teams have been investigating the towns and the villages of Central and Eastern Europe, interviewing uh, people and locating uh, mass graves. As part of this fieldwork, uh, our ongoing uh, research has indexed the location of more than 3,300 killing sites of Jews, but also uh, of other um, groups persecuted by Nazis in the uh, East, especially Roma, but also uh, patients of psychiatric hospitals, prisoners of war, Soviet activists, and, and others. Uh, so these findings have been made possible through interviews uh, with uh, more than 7,900 uh, witnesses uh, in uh, 11 countries. Ukraine, Russia, Belarus, Poland, Moldova, Romania, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, former Republic of Macedonia and uh, Slovakia. And the expertise that we acquired over many years of uh, research uh, into these mass crimes has led uh, the organization to conduct uh, investigations about other cases of mass violence. In 2011, where the organization began a research project on the armed conflict in Guatemala. Uh, during which more than 200,000 people, mainly Maya, were murdered between 1960 and 1996. Uh, Since 2015, uh, the organization has been also collecting testimonies from the victims of ISIS in Iraq and Syria, especially members of the Yazidi uh, community uh, persecuted uh, by uh, the Islamic State since August 2014 and following uh, Russia's attack on Ukraine in February 22, uh, the team of the FIA had started to document the war crimes committed by the Russian army uh, in uh, Ukraine. So after this uh, brief uh, introduction uh, to our work, uh, I will now 
talk more about uh, the activities of our organization regarding the, the genocide of Roma. When in 2004, Father Debois started to travel to Ukraine uh, to interview the witnesses of the mass killing of the Jews and to find the mass graves of the victim, uh, he very quickly noticed um, that the witness he, is interview he was interviewing, uh, they, of course, uh, were witnesses of, 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 of the fate of, of their Jew Jewish neighbors during the Holocaust, but there were also uh, very often uh, witnesses of persecutions uh, of other groups uh, targeted by uh, Nazis in Eastern uh, occupied uh, territories, especially after the beginning of the Operation Barbarossa. Uh, we talk here uh, mostly about the Roma population, but also about Soviet prisoners of war, patient of psychiatric hospital and, and, and other groups. And since then, um, the, it was an ethical choice, but the choice was made to conduct investigation uh, in these territories about the fate of all the groups persecuted by, uh, by Nazis. Uh, and uh, so we are uh, we started to collect these testimonies of uh, about the Roma uh, genocide uh, in 2007, 2008, uh, starting in, in Ukraine and 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 and, and Russia. Uh, so, as as for the main char characteristics of the Roma genocide. Uh, in the Eastern Territory is worth remembering uh, that one of the feature uh, of the genocide was that it was not consistent, as you know. The persecution of the Roma and its intensity uh, varied from uh, territory uh, to territory. During our research, we mostly uh, documented uh, the fate of Roma uh, during the the, uh, the Second World War, in three uh, geographical areas, uh, we uh, worked mainly uh, in um, what was the the, the German occupied Soviet Union. Uh, we also uh, did research uh, on the territories of the former General Gouvernement, uh, and but also uh, we uh, did. Uh, several uh, mission of research uh, in the territories that were under Romanian uh, control. So basically, uh, our research about the Roma uh, genocide is conducted on two levels. Uh, we are uh, investigating the mass killings uh, of Roma uh, in Eastern uh, occupied uh, territories, uh, it means mostly uh, in that case former Soviet Union, but also uh, we collected uh, dozens of testimonies uh, in, a, in a, the former territory of, of occupied uh, Poland. And uh, the uh, second uh, level is the interview, uh, the interviews uh, with uh, the survivors, uh, mostly conducted in, in, in Romania with the survivors uh, of the uh, deportation uh, to Transnistria. I will come back to that in a, in a, in a few minutes. Uh, but uh, I would like to talk first about this first level and the investigation that we are conducting uh, in uh, about the mass killings of uh, Roma. Uh, so I, as it was mentioned by by Carola and 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 Vola, there were. Uh, many uh, places uh, in those areas where the Roma population was uh, executed, uh, uh, once uh, once uh, arrested by uh, by uh, Nazi uh, Nazis units. So we are trying to before going to the ground to find those locations and uh, to interview the witnesses of of the, the of the killings. The first step of our uh, work uh, is to um, is to uh, do a research uh, in the archives. We work mostly with the archives of 
uh, the uh, Soviet Extraordinary uh, Commission that was created uh, when the, the war was still ongoing at that, uh, at the, when the, the towns and, and the Soviet uh, and the villages of Soviet Union were uh, liberated. Um, so this is an example, for instance, of documents uh, that we, we use to prepare as an example of the Soviet Commission. You have acts, you have the position of, of witnesses uh, in, the, in the commission, and you have also sketches, which are very useful documents for us, because uh, you can, as you can notice, uh, you have, uh, in some cases, uh, sketches done by uh, by the commission with the location of uh, the killing sites. Uh, we in uh, in in the countries where um, the archives are, are accessible, we also work with the archives of the of the KGB. Uh, we work also, of course, with German uh, documents. So it means war archives, mostly reports of Einsatzgruppen. You can see an example here. Uh, of uh, reports sent by the uh, Einsatzgruppe, uh, by the Einsatzgruppe D, uh, but we work also a lot uh, with the uh, archives uh, that we can find uh, in uh, the um, files that are uh, built to uh, put German uh, perpetrators uh, in uh, justice, which are uh, like the, the famous collection uh, B162, which is available uh, at the uh, Ludwigsburg uh, Federal uh, Archives in Germany. And so once we uh, have this uh, archives, uh, we go to the field. Uh, we prepare some maps to organize uh, our uh, research mission. So this is like uh, the map that we created to investigate uh, in uh, uh, Crimea, uh, which was still Ukraine at that uh, at that time. Uh, and uh, in a green color, you can see uh, the sites that we uh, located uh, during the, the research in the archives and uh, once we were on the ground, of course, we visited these places uh, with the goal to find uh, eyewitnesses of the of the of the of the the, the mass killings. So th this is just an, an example. Of course, there can be there are certainly more sites on the, in these territories, but this is the the map that we did after first. Uh, check uh, in into the uh, into the the, uh, the the archives we had uh, at uh, this time. After that, we go on the ground. Our teams are consisting of uh, investigators who are uh, going to 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 these places that are mentioned in the archives, and they are looking uh, for uh, people who uh, were born uh, before the Second World War and uh, asking them simple question, uh, if they are from the village or from the town, and if they were here the day when uh, there was uh, the mass execution of uh, Roma, for instance. And if yes, and if they remember uh, the story, if they witnessed um, something by, by themselves, we conduct uh, an interview with them. The interview is, is video recorded. I would like to, sh to show you a very short excerpt of, 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 of an interview. Uh, this is a, an interview that uh, was recorded uh, in uh, Alexandrovka. It's a well-documented uh, execution site in Smolensk area uh, in Russia, where we could interview a man. Uh, sorry, there is a mistake. He was born in 1933, uh, not 43. So he was a child at the time of, of the execution. The execution was uh, uh, in uh, April uh, 42. Uh, and uh, I would like to show you his testimony. Это было 22 или 24 апреля 
эти все цыгане собирались выезжать в поле, пахать, ну, им дорабатывать. Весной, как у нас называют, трать облогу. И в это время получилось, что немецкая, ну, как их называли, эсэсовцы, окружили деревню. Вот. Окружили и всех, всех, где, какая, кто не жил, всех вот туда вот к озеру пригнали. И стали, видимо, уже список был готов, кто русский, кто цыган, кто еще кто. Вот. И стали по списку, стали по списку покликовать. Скажите, где это было? Мой дом, я жил вот здесь, вот, вот напротив. И вот этот дом. Это был мой и дед. Жили мать. У меня младший брат еще есть. Когда война началась, ему было только всего на всего 10 месяцев. Вот мать, я и братишка. Жили вот в этом доме. Фактически не этот дом. Но и у всех, всех вот этих всю деревню. И с этого согнали вот сюда, на эту площадку, вот здесь дорога, вот здесь. Ну и остальные там по соседям пошли, то есть это вот, собрали лопаты. И 13 человек, мужиков, которые были более крепкие, сильных, собрали и удалили лопаты сюда, в край другого. Ну тут догадались уже, куда за щепки, что, к чему. Ну и из-за того, что... У малых и любопытство большое бывает. Я в тот период, ну, уже пожалуйста, то ли мы, о, слышно, слышно взрывы какие-то там за деревни. А получилось то, что земля еще была мороженая, лопатами там без, без свой маленький там попробовали сняли этот свой. А, а глыбше мороженая земля, им пришлось динамит обрывали. Вот, землю эту взорвали, тогда эти люди, которых они забрали с собой, раскидали, расчистили, короче говоря, сделали могилу братскую. А рядом там, где расстреливали, вот, была так называемая уня. Раньше комбайнов не было, жали вручную, серпами жали. Вот, поэтому... Людей всех этих, которых по списку отсчитали, вычислили, забрали сюда и в пуню выйду. Там их раздевали, как мать родила, наголо. So the, the, the interesting fact here is, uh, I mean, there are several interesting facts in the, in the testimony, but, but this is a testimony also of a Roma survivor. Uh, so Sergei survived uh, the uh, massacre because some local uh, people uh, said to the to the Germans that uh, they were not uh, Roma but that they were uh, Russian. Uh, and as uh, they uh, the brother of 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 Sergei uh, was uh, was blonde, uh, they didn't like to they didn't correspond to the stereotype of Roma. They were spurred uh, by the uh, by the by the, uh, by by the killers on uh, that day. Uh, so this testimony is very representative of the testimony that we can hear uh, about uh, the executions perpetrated uh, by uh, Nazi unit at the, uh, in these areas uh, with the, this process of gathering the victims, uh, with putting them in the building. He's speaking also about the undressing and then about the uh, the, the killing. He saw the killing from he climbed on his roof on the roof of his house to. Uh, to 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 witness uh, the to witness the the execution and the other interesting fact is that Alexandrovka uh, in the village there was um, a colpos that was created uh, in the interwar period uh, and um, so as you as you may know uh, Soviet authorities tried to settle uh, nomadic uh, Roma in the twenties and the thirties. And so Alexandrovka was one of these uh, kolkhozes 
uh, where there was an important Roma population. And so the last thing I wanted to, to say about the testimony is the fact that you hear the, the word gypsy uh, there in the question, in the answers. This is done on, on purpose uh, because this is the language that is uh, spoken by the uh, witnesses that we interviewed. They don't use the uh, the word uh, Roma, but they 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 they, they more uh, speak about uh, they use the word uh, Tigane. So up to date, uh, we uh, collected uh, four hundred. Um, Michael, Michael, could you also please come to to an end? Um, yeah, sure. We have a final discussion. Yeah, so uh, we collected like testimonies of. Uh, 435 uh, witnesses of uh, the mass uh, executions of Roma in Eastern occupied uh, territories. And we located uh, uh, 113 uh, killing sites in this uh, in this area. And so very briefly about the second level of, of, of our research, we do interviews with uh, the Roma uh, survivors that were deported to Transnistria, uh, that uh, you know that in, in summer and early fall 42, the fascist regime of Antonescu deported uh, approximately really 25,000 uh, Roma to Transnistria, over half of the uh, victims were uh, children. And so we are, since 2010, going to Romania uh, to uh, find the last survivors of this uh, deportation. So this deportation are um, this uh, these testimonies are are uh, mostly about uh, the pre-war period, but of course also about the war period, the arrest of the people, the deportation, the condition of life uh, in Transnistria, uh, the forced labor, the violence, also and the 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 um, the, the killings inflicted upon the Roma by uh, Romanian uh, fascists and uh, and. Uh, and helpers, and this project is conducted by young uh, Roma who are grandchildren of survivors. Uh, and we interview up to date 160 uh, uh, survivors, mostly uh, in uh, Romania. Um, and but we also did one research mission in the former Republic of Macedonia to uh, document the persecution experienced by Roma populations. Uh, in territories under Bulgarian uh, authority. This includes, for instance, testimonies about first labor, but also uh, sexual uh, violence about women uh, of the community. Uh, we did also one, uh, and I will finish with, uh, with that. Uh, uh, we did also uh, once uh, a project that was about uh, to uh, bring uh, two survivors uh, of the deportation to uh, to Transnistria from Romania to the villages uh, to the village uh, where there there was uh, they were deported in Transnistria. It was in 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 Kovalivka, and uh, to uh, so to have a, a, a description uh, of of uh, of the exact location where was the camp. Well, also the, the where was also the, the grave of uh, where uh, where the victims were buried when they were uh, when they, they they died or where they were killed uh, in uh, in or outside uh, the camps. So up to date, we have a collection of around six hundred of uh, almost six hundred testimonies, including like this one hundred sixty uh, testimonies of 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 survivors. And uh, for those who would be interested, this uh, testimonies, we are starting in January 2024 right now uh, to uh, upload them online on a, on a, on a video platform, uh, which will make uh, it accessible for uh, everyone. So uh, if you would like to have more uh, information about that, I recommend you to uh, just go on our website or to follow our social network, and and we will uh, soon publish some some information about this uh, this platform. So thank you very much for your attention, and I'm available for any question. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Michael, for this um, very interesting presentation. I have already have three questions, but if I may, I would like 
to ask you an immediate question with regard to the interview by Sergei, uh, which you showed to us. How do you deal with the fact um, that obviously Sergei, born in 1943, can not have been, cannot have witnessed all what you see he is describing? Obviously, this is telling of his of other elder people. Um, how do you deal with this um, in methodological terms? Of course, we have uh, to have a critical approach uh, towards the, uh, the the witnesses that we that we interview and the, towards the testimonies uh, that we gather, especially that they are uh, recorded like eighty years uh, after the 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 event. Uh, uh, the event now. So what we are doing is is mostly that we are cross-referencing all the sources that we have. Uh, we have um, uh, we are cross-referencing the uh, the testimonies uh, between themselves. Uh, after the interviews, we try all the time also to bring the witness uh, to the different sites that are mentioned into into in the interview, and of course during the interviews. We try to see. Uh, we have like some met methodological tools uh, to see, uh, to ask questions, to see if the witnesses was really here at the, uh, during the 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 event that that uh, uh, that he he was describing. But but of course uh, the 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 sources have uh, as each sources its own limits. Yeah, yeah. So if you agree, we can continue um, like. 10, 15 uh, minutes longer. And um, I pronounce the first questions from the chat. Um, so Michael is asking, what is the current accepted estimate for the number of Roma and Sinti deaths at the hands of the Nazis? I have seen one estimate that including the killings by the Einsatzgruppen, the total number of victims may exceed um, one and a half million. Um, and then there are two more questions to Michael. I think I may ask uh, answer the first question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, of course, the, this is pure fantasy. One point five million victims. We will never reach that, even if we do much more research than we do nowadays. Uh, also, five hundred thousand victims is also not based on empirical findings. Uh, well, roughly in general, we say around about 200,000 victims, but still this number is not so substantiated when it comes to the questions, uh, question of do we know names, do we have names, do we have lists, can we identify these victims. There's still a lot of research to do, of course, and if we look at the exact, well, identifications we have at the time, we might name 110, 120,000, maybe. Uh, and still, of course, a lot of uh, atrocities happened without registrating people or without writing down the names. And of course, uh, Michal uh, Shuryak's um, investigations show that there's Still a lot to find out and to identify. So to, to answer, it's difficult to answer these questions. Well, we historians say around about maybe 200,000, but still insecure. Yeah, thank you, uh, Karola. Um, I have two more questions to, to Michael. The first by, um, by Leah. Um, is your organization, Yahad Inunum, planning to interview and collect testimonies from Israeli victims of the massacre from October 7th? Is she asking? And um, the second question by Daniela also to Michael is, have you found testimonies of mass graves of Roma and Sinti victims killed on the spot in the general gouvernement? Um, so uh, I will start with the with the first question. Thank you for a question. Uh, I'm there are discussion about that. Uh, I don't want to, to I cannot like uh, give too much information about this for the moment because like uh, we are we are thinking about that, but it's not done uh, yet. and uh, 
we will see in the next weeks how the the situation also uh, evolves but 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 we had some requests to 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 be uh, involved about about that they Thank cannot you. say 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 much about that. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, regarding to the second question, uh, yes, uh, of course we have testimonies uh, we found with nurses uh, of Roma uh, executed uh, during mass killings uh, in the General Gouvernement. If I uh, remember well, we have around uh, between 30 and 40 uh, killing sites that are concerning the, the territories of the General Gouvernement, but uh, there are still a lot uh, to do uh, in the in the in the territories of 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 Poland, uh, as uh, Carola mentioned, there is there is like this this estimate that was that was done that that there is like a, a, there could be a, even more than one hundred eighty uh, killing sites uh, in the area. So so yes, we the project is ongoing. So we'll have uh, still research trips, uh, I guess three or four this year. So I'm sure that we will uh, be able to collect new documentation about uh, this execution and to locate some of the some of the sites. Yeah, um, I see no further questions at the moment. I have another question to um, to Volha. Um, Ah, Corolla raised her hand. Um, yeah, I would like to, also that, um, I find this story of the Romani woman in the partisan units very um, fascinating. And I would like to ask you if you could tell us a little bit more about the situation. There is a lot of, or there is research um, on the situation of um, Soviet women in partisan units, also t telling us about um, sexual violence and it's not has not been so easy for women to be there so can you what what do you know about the situation of of romani women yes thank you very much for this excellent question i think that um, actually romani women uh, shared uh, their experiences with uh, other uh, the women uh, in the par in partisan units, and uh, there were, for example, cases of um, the so-called uh, partisan marriage, which was unofficial, of course. When, uh, um, as I've learned from one family, for example, uh, a Romani girl was uh, in a relationship with. Uh, a partisan leader and um, he um, abandoned her after the war so there was uh, also a lot of drama around this story and um, uh, they felt mostly uh, they felt safe uh, only when they were with uh, uh, their brothers or husbands in these units otherwise uh, um, all what you know about the experiences of Soviet women uh, in the movement uh, uh, has um, um, to do with uh, the Roma woman, the women as well. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So there's another question by Carola. Uh, oh no, it was not a question. I just wanted to uh, add something to the to the issue of the numbers or figures because. It's, it's really very, I think it's a sensitive and political question. And uh, because it also, also sometimes has uh, such an undertone of, well, was it really a genocide if we look at the numbers and so on? And I think we have to take also into account the, I always say there were hundreds of th thousands Sinti and Roma being persecuted and murdered. We should not only talk about the murdered, we should also talk about the ones that had been sterilized, that survived camps and so on. We all know that this is also a very hard burden, this, this persecution and the survival of this persecution. Uh, and we 
as I said before, we always have to take into account that the research on this issue started really very, very late, that a lot of documentation has been destroyed, that the registration of Roma was not uh, intensive in all the countries we know and so on. There are a lot of, uh, I think, aspects that have to take into account. Therefore, I myself, I really do not like to say any number <laughs> because every number at the moment is false. And so I'm very, very reluctant re regarding this. But of course, there will be an article, a lemma about this question in the encyclopedia. But I think not before 2025 <laughs> when we have collected the whole stuff together. Yeah, thank you for clarifying. And I would also like to add that according to the UN Genocide Convention, uh, genocide not necessarily has to do with high numbers. No? Also numbers don't play a role there at all in the definition. Um, yeah, so I see no further questions. So I would like to, to thank all our participants and organizers um, for this, this great collaborative project. And um, yeah, wish you all a nice um, evening and yes, soon on other occasions. So, and I would uh, like to say some closing sentences. First of all, Tanya, thank you for the moderation, Carola, for the nice collaboration, always, I'm very happy about it again. And of course, Folha and Michal for your very fascinating lectures. And yes, I wish also to thank the colleagues at Western Galilee College. And I would like uh, warmly uh, to invite you for our next event on the 12th of February, which will again be a collaborative event with the Moses Mendelssohn Center in Potsdam. It's two-folded. We have session one online about, and it's a total Israeli panel. We have, for example, two distinguished researchers who um, deal with the topic of children held, by, held hostage by Hamas and the child hostages after their release. For example, we have the CEO of the Schneider Children's Medical Center with us, and we have a historian with us who built a school for children evacuated from southern Israel after 7th of October um, in Tel Aviv. And the next day, we are working really hard to have our uh, um, conference, our, our workshop um, broadcasted via a live stream, but we are still working on this. So thank you very much. Have a nice evening wherever you are. Bye-bye. <laughs>